just told me Roger's wrong saying he's having a bit of car trouble. Oh. Not again. He's somewhere on the North Circuit. Apparently it's taken him ages to find a phone box that's working and what with the tube strike he's going to be pretty late I'm afraid. But don't worry I'll read in the part of the hotel manager if he hasn't arrived by then. And I hope you're all happy with Graham's set design. As he says with the small stage we can't do very much about Ibsen's mountains but at least the first act simple enough. Hotel Terrace Centre Stage, Hotel Entrance Stage Left, Irene's Pavilion Upstage Left. It looks a bit too small on Graham's model, Gerald. Oh, uh, right. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm afraid it's not as big as I hoped, uh, Phyllis. <laughs> You'll just have to squeeze into it as best you can. <laughs> right, let's make a start. I'd really like to run straight through Act 1 if we can. I, I might need a couple of prompts, Joe. Oh, that's all right, Toby. We know you'll get there in the end. <laughs> right, so, Rubeck and Meyer are sitting at that table reading their newspapers. Yes, use anything for now, even Toby's daily mirror. OK, let's go. <clears throat> well, Meyer? What's the matter? I'm just thinking how quiet it is here. You can hear that, can you? Yes, of course I can. Silence is deafening. Oh, here at the bars, you mean? Wherever you go here, it seems to me. Of course there was noise and bustle as we passed through the town, but even the noise and bustle seemed to have something dead about it. You don't seem particularly glad to be home again, Maya. Are you? Well, no, to be quite candid, perhaps not entirely happy. There, you see, didn't I know it? Perhaps I've been abroad for too long. I've drifted away from the life here. Well, there, Rubeck. We had much better get away again as quickly as we can. Well, that's what we intend to do, my dear Maya. You know that. But why not now, at once? Think how cosy and comfortable we could be in our lovely new house. We ought by rights to say our lovely new home, Maya. I prefer to say house. Let's keep to that. You really are a strange person, Maya. Am I? Yes, I think so. Besides, who was it who was so keen to come north this summer? Yes, I admit it was me. We could have stayed at home or in our villa on Lake Tarnitz, which are both spacious enough. No, no, we there's... have been bumping into each other. No lack time. of space, it's true. But now we're up here. And we have tomorrow to look forward to when we'll board the luxury steamer you saw waiting in the harbour and sail away up the coast, all the way to the Polar Sea. Yes, but then you'll see nothing of the country or the people and that's what you particularly wanted to do. I've seen quite enough of all that. Do you think a sea voyage will be better for you? Better for me? But why do you say that? There's nothing in the world the matter with me. Yes, there is, Rubeck. I'm sure you must feel that yourself. <coughs> Well, my dearest Maya, what is the matter with me? Well, that you must tell me. You've begun to wander about without a moment's peace. You can't rest anywhere, either at home or abroad. And you've become quite a misanthrope of late. Oh dear, you've noticed that, have you? No one who knows you can help noticing it. And then it's so sad you've lost all pleasure in your sculpture. You've noticed that too, have you? Yes. You used to be so tireless, working from morning to night. Used to be, yes. But ever since you got your great masterpiece off your hands. The resurrection, eh, you mean? Yes, the one that's gone around the world and made you so famous. Perhaps that's just my misfortune, Maya. What do you mean by that? I mean that once I'd finished my masterpiece, for it is a masterpiece, or it was in the beginning, no, no, it still is. 
It must, must, must be a masterpiece. Why, Rubeck? All the world knows it's a masterpiece. All the world knows nothing. Well, understands nothing. The world must see something in it. There's something that isn't there, yes. Something that was never in my mind. Oh, they can all go into ecstasies about that. What's the use of working oneself to death for people like that? Do you think, then, that it is more worthwhile to create nothing these days but a portrait bust now and then? <laughs> They're not exactly portrait busts that I turn out, my. What are they, then? There's something cryptic lurking in them. Something people can't see. Oh, on the surface, I give them a striking likeness, as they call it. Something they can all stand and gape at in amazement. But behind that likeness, they're all pompous asses and greedy pigs. <laughs> but they pay me good money. Almost their weight in gold, as the saying goes. Oh, come, Rebecca. Drink and be happy. Oh, I'm happy enough, Maya. Really happy in a way. After all, there's a certain happiness in feeling oneself free and independent, in having everything one could possibly wish for. All the outward things, I mean. Don't you agree with me, Maya? Yes. Well, that is fine enough in its way. But do you remember what you promised me that day we came to an understanding about... Well, about that difficult matter? You mean our marriage? Yes. I know that wasn't an easy thing for you, Maya. No, it wasn't. But I said that I would go abroad with you and stay there for good if need be. And do you remember what you promised me that day? No, I, I can't say that I do. Well, what did I promise you? You said that you would take me up to a high mountain and show me all the glories of the world. Did I promise you that too? Yes, you did. And who else, if you please? <laughs> no, I, I only meant did I promise to show you... All the glories of the world. Yes, you did. And all that glory should be mine, you said. That's the sort of figure of speech I use once upon a time. So it was only a figure of speech? Yes. Sort of thing I used to say when I wanted to get the village children to come out and play with me. <laughs> Perhaps you only wanted me to come out and play. Well, hasn't it been quite an amusing game we've played, Ma? I didn't marry you only to play. No. No. And you never took me with you up any high mountains or showed me... All, all the glory of the world? No, I did not. But let me tell you something, Maya. You are not born to be a mountaineer. And yet at one point you seemed to think I was. Four or five years ago when we married, yes. But four or five years is a long, long time, Maya. Has the time seemed so very long to you, Rubeck? Yes, I'm beginning now to find it so. Well, then I, I shan't bore you any longer. Right, it's coming along nicely. I've got a couple of notes, but they can wait till later. There's no sign of Roger, so I'll read in the hotel manager. Everyone, everyone ready? Right. I wish you good morning, Mrs. Rubeck. Good morning, Professor. Good morning. May I venture to ask if you have slept well? Yes, thank you, excellently. I always sleep like a lock. I'm delighted to hear it. The first night in a strange place is often rather trying. And the professor? Oh, my night's sleep is never very good, I'm afraid. Especially of late. Oh, uh, that's a pity. But after a few weeks' stay here at the baths, you'll quite get over that. Tell me, it's a matter of interest. Are any of your guests in the habit of visiting the baths at night? During the night? No, I've never heard of such a thing. Have you not? No, I don't know of anyone so ill as to require such treatment. In that case, is there someone who's in the habit of walking in the grounds at night? No, Professor, that would be against the rules. There, Rubeck. I told you so. You must have dreamt it. Indeed. Must I? Fact is, I got up last night. I couldn't sleep. I wanted to see what sort of night it was. Yes. So I looked out of the window and I caught sight of a white figure in there among the trees. Most remarkable. Was it a, a gentleman or a lady? I could almost have sworn it was a lady. And dressed in white, you say? Yes, from head to toe. She looked almost ghost-like. Ah. And she moved in a very slow and deliberate way. Then I think I can explain the mystery, Professor. Uh, what is it? Was the Professor really not dreaming? Uh, shh, don't speak for a moment. Look over there. A lady? Who is she? 
I know very little about it, Professor. She arrived from abroad about a week ago and has taken that little pavilion there. What's her name? Uh, she has registered herself uh, as Madame de Sartov. Sartov? Sartov. Do you know anyone of that name, Rubeck? No, no one. Sartov? It sounds Russian or at all events Slavonic. What language does she speak? I have only spoken to her briefly on a few occasions, and she is far from communicative, but when we talk, she speaks Norwegian like a native. Norwegian? Yes, with perhaps a hint of a North Country accent. That too. Perhaps this lady has been one of your models. <laughs> my models? In your younger days, I mean. They say you use lots of models then. Oh no, my. I've had only one model, one and one only, for all my work. Look out for the dogs, <coughs> you lads. If you'll excuse me, Professor, I see someone coming that I'd rather not meet, especially in the presence of ladies. Who is it? It's a certain Mr. Ulfheim. Ah, Mr. Ulfheim. The bear hunter, they call him. I know him slightly. He only comes here once a year on his way to his hunting grounds. <laughs> excuse me, Professor. Stop a moment, man. Ah, damn it, can't you stand still? Why do you always keep skulking away from me? Is that any way to treat your guests? Has Mr. Ulfheim arrived by the steamer? <sighs> and with the pleasure of seeing any steamer. Don't you know I sell my own cutter? Uh, would Mr. Ulfheim care to go to the dining room for some lunch? Well, in there, amongst all the dead flies and people, no thank you. Well, uh, as you wish. But, uh, tell your housekeeper to make me up a hamper as usual with plenty of provender and lots of brandy and tell her to find out some good fresh bones for my dogs and make sure they're raw and bloody ones, eh? Yeah, yes, we know how you'd like things, Mr. Ulfheim. Can I give the waiter any orders, Professor? Uh, no, thank you. Nothing for me. Uh, no, for me. Oh, blow me. If I'm not a country boy who's strained a tip-top company, what do you mean by that, Mr. Orvay? I mean, I believe I have the honour of addressing no less a person than the great sculptor Wubeck. I remember meeting you once or twice the autumn when I was here last. Uh, yes. Yes, but that was many years ago. Well, back then you weren't so famous as I hear you've become today. <laughs> Why, in those days, even a dirty bear hunter like me could venture to approach you. <laughs> I don't bite you <laughs> now. Are you really and truly a bear hunter? A bear hunter when I get the chance, madam. But I'll make the best of any sort of game that comes my way. Eagle, wolf, reindeer, women. Just as long as they're fresh and juicy, with plenty of blood in them. But you like bear hunting best? I like it best, yes. But then I have my knife in my hand. We both of us work with hard materials, your husband and I. He struggles with blocks of marble and I I struggle with tents and quivering bear flesh. We both of us win our fight in the end. We never give up until we have the upper hand. There's a great deal of truth in what you say. Yes. Yes, I, I'm sure I am. I mean, stone may be dead, but it has something to fight for. It is dead, but it is determined not to let itself be hammered back into life. Yes? Are you going up into the forest now to hunt? Yes. Yes, I'm going right up into the high mountains. I don't suppose you've ever been up into the high mountains, have you, madam? No, never. Ah. Well, you must come up there this summer. I'll take you with me. But both you and the professor, it would be a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, but Rubeck is thinking of taking a sea trip this summer. Around the coast, through the island channels. What the devil would you do in those fetty gutters? Floundering around in the ditch water, dish water, I'd rather call it. You hear that, Rubeck? <laughs> no, no, no. No, far better to come with me up into the mountains, away from this land and its stench. Can't you smell it? It reeks of rotting flesh. People who are sickly and on their last legs should have the decency to get themselves buried, and the sooner the better. <laughs> Have you ever been ill yourself, no, Mr. Ulfheim? Never. And if I had, I wouldn't be here now. Oh, but my, my dear friends, they've been ill, poor things. Oh, what did you do for them? I shot them, of course. Shot them? Shot them dead? I never miss, madam. But how could you possibly shoot people? <laughs> I'm not speaking of people. But you said your dearest friends. Well, how else should they be but my dogs? 
are your dogs your dearest friends? I have none better. They are my honest, trusting, absolutely loyal comrades. Uh, but when one of them becomes sick and miserable, oh, bang! and that's my good friend sent packing into the other world. I see. But while they're alive, you should see how much they enjoy themselves. You should see my comrades feeding. <laughs> Would you like to see that? Oh, yes, very much so. Spoken like a woman with spirit. <laughs> come, come, come and you'll see how they, how they swallow whole great thumping bones. Ah, it's a joy to watch them. Come, come. And then, and then we shall talk about going up into the mountain. See? <laughs> I know you quite well, Irene. You can guess who I am then, Arnold. And you recognize me, Irene? With you, it is quite another matter. With me? In what way? You are still alive. Alive? Who was the other, the woman who was sitting at your table? That was my wife. Indeed. That is well, Arnold. Someone who doesn't concern me. No, of course not. Someone you have taken to you after my lifetime. After your... What do you mean by that, Harry? And the child. I hear the child is prospering too. Our child survives me and has come to honour and glory. Our child. Yes, we called it that in those days. In my lifetime, yes. Yes, Irene. And I can assure you, our child has become famous all over the world. I suppose you've read about that. Yes, and has made its father famous too. That was always your dream. It is to you that I owe everything, Irene. Everything. And I thank you. If I had done what I had a right to do, Arnold. Well, what would you have done? I should have killed that child. Killed it? Killed it. Before I went away from you. Crushed it. Crushed it into dust. You wouldn't have done that, Irene. You hadn't the heart to do it. No. In those days, I had that sort of heart. But since then? Since then, I've killed it many times. Killed it in hatred, and in revenge, and in sorrow. Irene, tell me now, after all these years, why did you go away from me? You disappeared so completely. Oh, Arnold. Why should I tell you that now, from the world beyond the grave? Was there someone else you had come to love? There was one who no longer had any use for my love, any use for my life. Irene, let's not dwell on the past. No, those things are beyond the grave. Where have you been, Irene? You seem to have vanished into thin air. I went into the darkness whilst the child stood transfigured in the light. Have you travelled much in the world? Yes, I've been to many lands. And what have you found to do there? I've posed in variety shows. I've posed as a naked statue in tableau vivant. I've been paid handsomely for my work. 
I've had many admirers, men who desired me, unlike you, Arnold, who was always so reserved. And have you ever married? Yes. I married one of my admirers. He was a South American, a distinguished diplomat. I managed to drive him quite out of his mind. Where is he now? In a graveyard somewhere, with a fine monument over him, and a bullet rattling round in his skull. He, he, he killed himself? Yes. He was good enough to take care of that for me. But don't you mourn his loss, Irene? Mourn what loss? Why, the loss of Herr von Sattoff, of course. His name was not Sattoff. My second husband is called Sattoff. Where is he? Far away in the Ural Mountains among his gold mines. So he lives there? Perhaps. In reality, I've killed him. <sighs> Him. With the sharp little knife I always have with me. I don't believe you, Irene. You should believe it, Arnold. <sighs> you had children? Yes, I've had many children. Where are they now? I killed them. As soon as they came into the world, one after the other. There's a riddle behind everything you say, Irene. How can I help that? When every word I say is whispered into my ear. Perhaps I'm the only one who can understand you. Yes. You ought to be, Arnold. Some part of you has been lost, Irene. Doesn't that always happen when a young, warm-blooded woman dies? Oh, Irene, have done with these wild thoughts. You're alive, living, living. I was dead for many years. They came and bound me. I'm beginning, in a way, to rise from the dead. And in all this, do you hold me responsible? Yes. Responsible for your death, as you call it? Yes. For the fact that I had to die. Why don't you join me at my table, Arnold? May I? You needn't be afraid of being frozen. I don't think I'm quite turned to ice yet. There, Now we're sitting together, as in the old days. And a little apart from each other, also as in the old days. It had to be so, then. Had it? When I posed for you naked. Hour after hour, couldn't we once have moved closer to each other? Irene, do you think I wasn't tempted a hundred times? First and foremost, I was an artist. Yes. <coughs> That's it. That's just I, it. I thought if I touched you, if I desired you as a woman, my artist's soul would have been tainted and I should never achieve the vision I had in mind. And I still think there's much truth in that. The work of art first, and then the human being. You don't understand, Irene. Then I was consumed by the idea of creating a great work, a masterpiece. And when I found you, I, I saw at once you were the perfect embodiment of everything I imagined for my statue. A beautiful, pure young woman, awakening from the sleep of death. Our child, yes. 
thanks to you, I, I did finally achieve everything that I wished for. Yes. And then you had done with me. Oh, Irene, how can you say that? And you began to look for other visions. <clears throat> I found none. None after you. No other models, you Arnold? You weren't just a model for me, Irene. You were the inspiration for everything I achieved. And what have you made since I left you? I've done nothing. Just frittered my life away making gargoyles. And that young woman you're now living with? I don't... Don't mention her. I feel nothing but shame. Where are you thinking of going with her? Oh, on a tedious voyage to the north, it seems. Much better to go high up in the mountains, Arnold. As high as ever you can. Higher, higher, always higher, Arnold. Are you going up there? Do you have the courage to meet me once again? Oh, if only we could. Why shouldn't we? Oh, come up into the mountains with me, Arnold. To the very summit. Rubek! 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 Oh, I beg your pardon, Rubek. I see you've made an acquaintance. Renewed an acquaintance, Maya. Uh, what was it you wanted with me? I only wanted to say this. You may do whatever you please, but I'm not going on that wretched steamboat. And why not? Because I want to go into the mountains. And who's put that idea into your head? Why, that horrid bear hunter, of course. Oh, you can't imagine all the wonderful things he's been telling me about the mountains and life up there. Most of the tales he tells are ugly and repulsive. I almost think he's making them up. And yet, oh, they're so alluring all the same. Oh, you must let me go with him, Rubek. Of course. Uh, I haven't the slightest objection. Oh. Off you go, for as far and as long as you please. I may be going into the mountains myself. Uh, no, no, you needn't do that. Not on my account. I've made up my mind to go. But I can tell the bear hunter I can go with him now. Tell him whatever you like. Oh, thank you, Rubek. Thank you. So, I... Shall we meet on the mountain? Oh, yes, Arnold. I've searched for you so long. When did you begin to search for me? From the moment I realized I'd given you something rather precious. Something one ought never to part with. Yes, you gave me four or five years of your youth. Not more I gave you, spendthrift as I was then. You gave me so much, Irene. You gave me your naked beauty. But you've forgotten the most precious gift. The most precious? What gift was that? I gave you my young, living soul. And that gift left me empty. It left me without a soul. And it was that that I died of, Arnold. Irene! tables and so on and get the bench on we'll run act two. Not good news about Roger I'm afraid. The police have towed his car away. Apparently it was causing a huge traffic jam by Arnos Grove. Roger sounds in quite a state. 
That's Toby has an on for a bit. I said he can get in touch with the police and try and find out what's happening. And then... He does worry about things a bit too much, doesn't he? He does mean well. Yeah, I'm sure he does. Anyway, back to business. Now, as Graham says, we're keeping everything very simple for the uplands in Act 2. There'll just be a suggestion of mountains in the distance, and then the bench room deck sitting on downstage, and uh, Irene's rock near to it, uh, and a little bit of heather for you to stretch out on Tess. Okay, let's give it a go. Come from the hotel? No, no, not that mausoleum. We've been in the open air. We? Oh, I mean, myself and that horrid bear hunter, of course. Him? Oh, yes, we've been high up in the mountains. First thing tomorrow, we're off up there again. <laughs> to hunt bears? Oh, yes. Oh, really, I'm feeling quite exhausted. So much excitement, Maya. Oh. You mustn't overdo it. Don't worry for me. Little rest, and I'll have plenty of energy. But you're always so tired, Rubeck. One doesn't grow younger, Maya. One doesn't grow younger. But there's a look of such weariness in your eyes sometimes. It's, it's almost evil. So you are hatching some dark plot against me. Indeed. So that's what you think? Yes. And I think I know the cause of it all too. Do you? Yes. It's on account of that strange lady. <laughs> Madame von Sutton. Yes, she's always hovering around us. Yesterday she was up here too. So? Oh, I know you knew her very well, long before you knew me. And had forgotten her too, long before I knew you, Maya. Can you forget so easily, Rick? Yes, very easily indeed, when I want to. <laughs> My, how serious you look. <laughs> yes, perhaps I do. We need to talk seriously, Maya. You begin to make me feel curious. Only curious, not a little uneasy. Not in the least. Good. Then listen. You said that day at the bars that it seemed to you I'd become very on edge of late. Yes, and you really have. And what do you think can be the reason for that? How should I know? Perhaps you've grown tired of this constant companionship with me. Constant. Why not say everlasting? Does it really feel so for you, Rubeck? I know you're not a particularly sociable person. You like to keep yourself to yourself and think your own thoughts. And I can't talk to you about your work. I know nothing about art and that sort of thing. And care very little about it either, for that matter. Which is why we usually talk about your day. My day? Nothing very much happens in my day, as you know. Well, there may be trifles we talk about, but it passes the time. It's true, passes the time. But time is passing away from you, Rubeck, and I think that's what makes you so uneasy these days. Yes, and so restless. No, oh, I shan't be able to endure this pitiful life for much longer. If you want to get rid of me, you have only to say so. I shall go at once. Do you intend that as a threat, Maya? There could be no threat to you in what I said. No. No. But you and I can't possibly go on living together like this. Well, and what then? Well, just because we cannot go on like this doesn't mean that we have to part. Only draw away from each other a little more. <clears throat> Even that may not be necessary. Well then, say what you want to do with me. What I feel so keenly now, and, and so painfully, is that I need someone around me who really and truly stands close to me. Oh, don't I do that, Rubeck? Not in that sense, no. I, I need someone who can, as it were, complete me, be one with me in all my strength. It's true, those things are beyond me. Uh, yes, they... They don't come naturally to you, Maya. And heaven knows I don't want them to either. I know that very well. And it was no thought of finding those things that I married you. I can see in your face that you're thinking of someone else. Can you also see who it is I'm thinking of? 
yes. You're thinking of that model you once used, the one who now calls herself Madame de Sartoff. Yes, precisely. I'm thinking of her. And when she went away, when she disappeared completely... You accepted me as a sort of makeshift. <sighs> Something of the sort, yes. For a year or so, I lived alone. Lonely and full of dark thoughts. Then I put the very last touches to the Resurrection Day and sent it out into the world. And it brought me fame and wealth. But I no longer love my own work. All the plaudits and fanfares filled me with loathing. Till I could have rushed away and hidden myself in the woods. For I realised then that all the talk of an artist's vocation is hollow and meaningless. And then, besides all that, you've gone and tied yourself to me for life. I wouldn't have put it so unkindly, Maya. Yet you'd have meant it just the same. Yes, because I can no longer bear this life of idleness. I'm not made for it. I must go on working, producing one work after another until the day I die. And in that life you see no part for me? Not in my work, no. I, I realise that now. But of course, you're not at all to blame for this. I'm solely the cause of it. It's simply that I've awakened to a new life. My real life, Maya. But then why on earth shouldn't we part? Would you be willing to? Well, yes, if, if there's nothing else for it. Yeah, but perhaps there is something else for it. Ah, now you're thinking of her again. Yes. I can't stop thinking of her ever since I met her again. For I'll tell you a secret, Maya. Well? In here, you see. In here, I have a little casket. And in that casket are all my sculptor's visions. And when she went away, the lock on the casket snapped shut. And only she had the key. You, Maya, have no key. So, everything in the casket lies unused, and the years pass, and I have no means of getting at my treasure. Well then, you must get her to unlock the casket for you. Oh, if only she could. I'm sure she can. It's no doubt because of the casket that she's here. I I've not said a word to her about the casket. But she alone has the key, Rubeck, so why are we making all this fuss about what is really a very simple matter? Do you think it's so simple? Yes, I do. Surely in our large house there's enough room for three. Well, would you consider that? Yes, I, I would. I, I think with a little hard work it, it could work, but and there's no need to worry on my account, Rubeck. I should always find something to do somewhere in the world. A life that's free. Free. Free! And look, here comes your strange lady now. Where? There, out on the plain, striding like a marble statue. And she's coming this way. Doesn't she look like the resurrection incarnate? How could I have displaced her? Moved her into the shade, remodeled her. Fool that I was! What do you mean by that? Nothing. Nothing that you'd understand. You must speak with her alone. Where will you go in the meantime? From now on, I shall go my own ways. The Professor is waiting to speak with you, madam. What does he want? He wants you to unlock a casket that has snapped shut. Can I help him in that? He says you're the only person who can. Then I must try. Yes, madam. You really must. She, the other one, said you had been waiting for me. I've waited for you year after year without knowing it. But now I've found you again. Now that I am risen from the grave. Yes. Why do you sit there not looking at me? I, I daren't look at you. Why not? You have a past that haunts me, and I'm racked by my conscience. At last! Oh, 
Watch your zit. Keep still. Keep still. Now they've let me go for a moment. We can sit down and talk as we used to. You sit there, Arnold, where you were sitting. I'll sit here on this rock. Now we can sit and talk as we used to when I was alive. Oh, if only we could talk as we used to. Yes, when we were creating that statue, as it rose up bit by bit out of that raw, shapeless stone and stood transfigured as a vital human being. Our child, Arnold. Yes. We called it that in those days, and so it was in spirit and in truth. Yes, and it's for the sake of our child that I've made this long pilgrimage. For the statue? You call it what you will. I call it our child. Uh, and now you want to see it? Uh, perhaps you don't know it. It's been installed in a grand museum somewhere far across the world. Yes. I've heard people say that. Museums were always a horror to you. You called them mausoleums. I will make a pilgrimage to the place where my soul and my child's soul are buried. No, Irene. You must never see that statue again. I beg you, never, never see it again. Do you think it would mean a second death for me? I don't know what to think. How could I imagine you'd fix your mind so firmly on that statue? You who went away before it was finished. But it was finished. That was why I could leave you. Yes, it was finished then, but it wasn't what it became later. Arnold, have you done any harm to our child? Any harm? I'm not sure what you'd call it, Irene. Oh, tell me at once! What have you done to the child? I'll tell you if you'll sit quietly and listen. I'll sit as quietly as a mother can when she hears her child could be harmed. I, I was young then, Irene, with no experience of life. I thought the resurrection would be shown best as the figure of a pure young woman untouched by life. And so I stood there. Yes, you, you did then. And now? Don't I still stand so? Not entirely, no. What do you mean, not entirely? I learned about the world in the years after you left me, Irene. The resurrection day became for me something, something more complex. The little plinth you stood on, triumphant and alone, no longer allow room for all the imagery I wanted to add. What imagery did you want to add? I added things I saw in the world around me. I expanded the plinth, made it wide and spacious, and I added a little bit of the earth. And from fissures in the earth, men and women emerge, each with features that suggest those of different animals. But in the centre, there stands the of a young woman radiant with the joy of light. Not quite in the centre, no. I, I had to move the figure back a bit for the sake of the general effect. Otherwise, it would have been too dominant. But the light of joy still transfigures my face. In a way, yes, but a, a little more subdued. And that design expresses the way that you see life now, does it? Yes, by and large. And I've become just a figure in the background. Not in the background, but not quite in the foreground either. Those words have sealed your fate, Arnold. My fate? How I've placed myself in the group. At the front, beside the fountain, 
sits a man weighed down by guilt. I call him remorse for a forfeited life. He sits there, dipping his fingers in the fountain, trying to wash them clean. But he's tortured by the thought that never, never will he be able to do that and gain a new life. He'll be forever imprisoned in his hell. Poet! Why poet? Because you indulge yourself in endless thoughts and feelings. <laughs> and you've killed my soul so you wallow in remorse and self-pity. <laughs> With that you think you can wipe the slate clean? I'm an artist, Irene. With all my frailties, I was born to be an artist. And in this life, I shall never be anything else. But I, too, had a life to live and a destiny to fulfill. I should have borne children into the world. Real children, many children. Not children that are hidden away in museums. I should never have had anything to do with you. Yeah, those were beautiful days, Irene, as I look back on them now. Can you remember the summer we used to sit like this outside the little peasant hut on Lake Tarnitz? On Saturday evenings, yes. When we'd finished our week's work. And taken the train out to the lake to stay there over Sunday. Yes. And do you remember that game we played for hours? Sitting by the lake with the leaves and the water lilies. Oh. You called them swans. Yes. And then I made Lowen Great's boat out of a clump of leaves and yoked the swan to it. Yes. And you said, I was the swan that drew your boat. Did I say that? Yes, and then all your boats ran aground. Do you know, Irene, once I had the money, I bought that little hut. And do you live out there now, oh, no. in our hut? I had that pulled down a long time ago. I built a handsome villa on the site with a grand park all around it. It's there that we used. It's there that I usually live during the summer. Life was beautiful. Beautiful by the lake of Tarnitz. Yes. And yet we let all that life and beauty slip away. Can you remember a little word you said? when you'd finished with me and our child. Did I say something then that you still remember? Yes, you did. Have you forgotten it? I suppose I have. You took both my hands in yours and pressed them warmly. And I stood there waiting breathlessly. And then you said, this has been a wonderful chapter in my life. Did I say chapter? Yes. And with that word I left you. One word so long ago, Irene. Does repentance come too late now? Look there, Arnold. Now the sun has gone down behind the peaks. See what a red glow the rays cast over the heather. Long time since I've seen a sunset in the mountains. Or a sunrise. I don't think I've ever seen a sunrise. I once saw a wonderful sunrise. Did you? 
Where was that? High up on a mountain top. You lured me up there by promising me I'd see all the glory of the world. And I fell down and worshipped you. And then I saw the sun rise. Irene? Couldn't you come and live with us? What, with you and that other woman? Me, as in the old days. You could open up all the things that are locked away in me. I no longer have the key. You do. You're the only one who possesses it. Help me. Help me to live my life over again. Empty dreams, Arnold. Dead, empty dreams for the life that you and I led. There's no resurrection. <laughs> <laughs> There's Meyer off into the mountains with the bear hunter. Your lady, yes. Oh, or the others. Good night, Professor. Dream of me. Now I'm going off on my adventures. <laughs> What's the aim of this adventure? I'm going to put life before everything else. Ah, so you're going to do that too, are you? Yes. And I've already made up a little ditty about it. Have you now? Yes. And it goes like this. I am free, I am free, no more prison life will be. I am free as a bird on the wing. So it seems, I am. Yes. For I believe I have awakened at last. Well, good night to you both. And good luck with the adventure. <laughs> There's no luck involved. We just need my skill, and experience, and a sharp knife. In that case, I wish you all the ill luck in the world. <laughs> now there is a wish worth having. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> a summer night on the uplands. Yes, that would have been life. Will you spend a summer night on the uplands with me, Arnold? Yes. Yes, Irene. Oh, that could have been our life together. Yes. But we only see what we have lost when... When? When we dead awaken. And what do we see then? We see that we have never lived. As you know, Act 3 is so short that we're not planning on having a second interval. We'll just fade to black on Irene's line, and then cover the scene changes with a bit more of the Pierre Kent music. The stage will be all, more or less bare for the last act, uh, with a suggestion of the mountain path on Graham's backdrop. Uh, so, uh, Toby and Roland, if you can shift the bench out of the way for now. And any news of Roger? Uh, yeah, yeah, I spoke to him on the phone. He's, he's fine now. Good. Uh, I hope you can make it in tomorrow for the costumes. Yeah, I'll make sure he's there. He's, uh, he's staying with me tonight. Oh, good. Right, I thought we'd try some of the storm effects to give you an idea of the timings. Are we all set with those, Phil? Right. Let's go for it. And remember, Toby, you're hanging onto Maya's sleeve for your entrance. Yeah, I know I screwed it up last time. <laughs> okay, let's go. Let me go! Let me Whoa! go! Are you going to bite me? Let You're as fierce as a wolf. Let me go! No, I won't. Well, then I'm not going another step with you. Not another inch, do you understand? And how will you get away from me on this mountainside? Oh, uh, jump off that ledge if I have to. Well, dash yourself into a thousand pieces. Well, go on if that's what you want. Well, you're a fine one to go hunting with. Indeed. It's not only bears I hunt. So I see. Well, hunting bears is a fine sport, but well, this is the best sport of all, I think. Do you? So, where's this fine mountain lodge you told me about? Over there. That pigsty. That's well, not quite a castle, I grant you. But it'll do for our purposes. And what purpose is that? For us to rest in. You may rest assured I shall not set foot in it. Oh, well, that is a pity. 
But I have spent many a fine summer's night in there with my companions. <laughs> you mean with your other goats? Oh, oh! Oh, so I am no more than a mountain goat now, am I? Yes, with your horns. Uh -huh. And you can see them, can you? Yes, great big ugly horns you oh, have. Oh, wow. Beware my dart! Please, Mr. Wolfheim, try to behave yourself. It was just in jest. Well, I'm tired of your jest, and I'm tired of you. I'm going back down to the hotel. Oh, that is easier said than done, my fair companion. You'll need my help. I'm very sure I can manage on my own. <laughs> the more fool you. You doubt my strength, Mr. Ulfheim. It's not a matter of strength. It's a matter of knowledge and experience. You see that mist? Yes. In no time at all, it'll close in. You won't be able to see a thing. You wouldn't last five minutes on the descent. Well, then, you must help me. What else are you good for? <laughs> you are as sharp as an adder. <laughs> Here, take my hand. Certainly not. I shall follow behind you. Very well, madam. As you wish. You know, I once helped a young woman. Lifted her up from the gutter and carried her to a better life. Carried her in my heart, too. I would have done so for the rest of my life. Do you know what thanks I got for my pains? No. What did you get? I got these horns you say you can see so clearly. Is that not a most comical story? Oh yes. Very comical story. But I know another story that is even more comical. How does your story go? It goes like this. Once upon a time there was a rather stupid girl who had both a father and a mother, but there was very little money. One day a high and mighty master came to the door of their humble home, and he took this girl in his arms, as you did, and travelled far, far away with her. Was she so anxious to be with him? Yes, because she was rather stupid, you see. Ah, I'm sure he was a most brilliant and handsome man. <laughs> oh no, he wasn't very handsome. But he pretended that he would take her to a high mountain where there was nothing but light and sunshine. Oh, so he was a mountaineer, was he? Yes, in his way. Uh, and did he take her up with him? Oh yes, he took her up with him, just as he'd planned. Uh. No, he lured her into a cold and clammy cage where there was neither sunlight nor fresh air, only the cold, stone figures of ghosts all around the walls. Oh, damn it, that served her right. <laughs> yes. But isn't it a rather comical story, all the same? Well, my fair hunting companion, don't you think that we should, we should stitch the poor threads of our lives together? What? Are you taking up as a tailor now? Indeed. And why shouldn't we make something of a, of a human being out of our threads? And then when it's quite worn out, what then? Why, then we shall stand free and triumphant as the man and woman we truly are. You with your goat legs. <laughs> and you with your stick in the tail. But let's not talk of that. No, no, there's no time for that. I must get back down to the hotel. Stop! Where are you going? Down to the hotel, of course, before everyone wakes up. And then? Well, then we take our leave of each other with a polite, thank you for the pleasant adventure. Can we two part so easily? Yes, you haven't got the better of me, Mr. Bear Hunter. I've got a castle to offer you. What, to go with the pigsty, you mean? It's a far more grand affair than that. I've had quite enough of castles. Well, there are wonderful hunting grounds all around it. And are there works of art, too? Well, no, I... I haven't any works of art. Well, that's one thing in your favour, at least. <laughs> so will you go with me? There's a tame bird of prey keeping watch on me. Then we'll put a bullet in his wing, Maya! Come then, carry me down into the depths. Uh, it's high time. The mist is closing in. Is the path down very dangerous? What? Does it make you a little giddy? Oh, yes. But go and look over there. They're coming up the mountain. Which two? Those two, the Rubek and the old woman, his long lost love. And they're coming this way. Fancy that. You're. Your bird of prey and his strange lady. Can't we avoid them? That's impossible. There's no other way up or down on this side of the mountain. Well, then we, we shall face them out here. 
So, my uh, once again our paths cross. Have you been all night on the mountain as we have? Yes, we've been hunting. Have you come up the path together? Of course. From now on, the lady and I do not intend to part. Do you have any idea how much danger you're in? Didn't you see the mist? We did, but we thought we'd start out anyway. It seemed easy enough on the lower slopes. Ah, it is easy enough down there. But now you're up here, and you're stuck. You can't go up or down, and I can only guide one of you down in the tide. Of course. You must take Maya with you first. And you must stay here. Take, take some shelter in the hut. Didn't you hear the thunder? There's going to be a big storm coming. There may be avalanches. I will send some men with ropes. Come. Come. Maya, let us hurry. And don't be afraid to trust me completely. Oh, how I shall sing if I get out of this alive. Did you hear what he said, Arnold? Men with ropes are coming to fetch me. They'll tie my arms. Don't be alarmed, Irene. No one will touch you. No. I can see to that. What do you mean? I mean this. Iron. I carry it with me both day and night. What use is it here? It was intended for you, Arnold. For me? Outside the peasant's hut by Lake Tanitz, when you said with such icy coldness that I was only a chapter in your life, I wanted to stab you then. And why didn't you? Because I realised with a sudden horror that you were already dead. Dead? As I was. That we were two stone-cold corpses sitting by the lake. No, Irene. We were fully alive then, as we are now. And my love for you is burning as fiercely as ever. Too late. Too late, Arnold. That earthly love is dead in both of us. Oh, how utterly wrong you are, Irene. Our love is still ablaze in us. No. The young woman of the Resurrection Day can only see your life lying in its grave. Then let two of the dead live life to its fullest before we sink down into our graves again. Oh, yes, Arnold! But not here in this mist, with the mist wrapping round us like a shroud? No. Let's rise into the light in all its glittering glory. There we'll hold our marriage feast. And the sun may freely look on us, Arnold. And all the powers of darkness, too. Will you follow me, my beloved bride? Yes, Arnold. I'll follow you free and gladly. Let's rise through the mists and then... To the very summit that shines in the sun. Do you remember? We walked on deep packed ice across the lake, somewhere in Manitoba. You in your purple coat and muffled hat, me in my raccoon, two figures on a whitened plain who struggled to keep balance and recall what frosty feelings kept them at arm's length and let them slip alone. Ascasia here or there, or playful child or raucous dog crisscrossed this vast expanse where no sun shone and pale-rimmed clouds pressed down upon our herds. A silence mostly, though now and then our icy breaths exchanged formalities. Oh. 
I remember. We were very young. Yes. When did you write that poem? A few years ago, when I was looking back. What do you call it? The Iceman. Very apt. Do you know what that poem always reminds me of? How should I know? It reminds me of that Ibsen play you once acted in London. Which one? When We Dead Awaken. You played Rubeck's young wife, Maya. Ah, I remember now. It got dreadful reviews. But you weren't dreadful. In fact, I remember you did it very well. But no one likes the play. If I remember, it's pretty morbid. Lots of Nordic gloom and doom. About an old sculptor regretting he'd cared more for fame and fortune than love. Not what you'd call a light comedy. Exactly. His last play and a total flop. I'm not surprised. Oh, he was. He thought it was his best play. By all accounts, he wrote it like a man possessed. His family thought it was driving him mad. So how did he take it when it failed? He was devastated. He had a sort of collapse and never came out of it. So how come you know so much about all of this? It's a play that's always fascinated me. Trust you to love a flop. Oh, but I'm not sure that it is. It's beautifully crafted, and I love the passion in it. Yes, well, Maya had plenty of spark to her. What was that ditty she kept singing? I am free, I am free. Yes, that's it. And then she goes off with the bear hunter, who's full of life and wants to screw the hell out of her. Mm. What's that character's name? Orfheim. That's right. Do you remember Toby who played him? I remember he had the figure for it. Yes, thighs to die for. But he drove us all mad in rehearsal, missing his entrances, right. forgetting lines. He was a director's nightmare. Poor Gerald nearly murdered him a couple of times. But he was all right on the night, if I remember. Oh, yes. He was fine then. One of those actors who messes things up until you put an audience in front of them. Then all of a sudden everything clicks. Maddening, yes. But I don't understand. What's the connection between your poem and When We Dead Awaken? It's my Rubik moment. The old man regretting a lost love. Lost? Who are you kidding? You walked out, remember? Slam the door on our life together. I know. I was more than ready to give it another try. I know, but... You froze the Iceman. Yes, yes, may I call that? Why? Why did you do it? I don't know. I couldn't cope with it all. But we had it all, for God's sake. I felt like life was a prison. What, serving a life term with me? Something like that. I wasn't ready. When would you ever be ready, you big baby? Not for another big baby, anyhow. Yes, you made that very clear. Did I? Life's hell! Why bring another human being into all this shit? I remember I said something like that, yes. You even wrote a weepy poem about it. Uh, unbeing, you mean? Yes. Probably know it by heart. Not word for word, but certain lines, yes. Multiplying my faults unbearably. I remember that. But somehow you didn't mention my virtues. I have some genes too, you know. Of course, of course. Let me find the poem. Or rather, Playing God, I feared I'd multiply my faults unbearably, so you would curse creator and creation. And the other bit about having the guts. You might have had a thousand faces and the shrill voice of cousins, except I lacked the courage to create you. That just about sums it up. Scared to death. Of what? Of life. 
Commitment! All you've got to show for all these years is words, words, words. It's true. I produce words, not babies. Words, words, words. At least I didn't stop you having babies. No. But I wanted yours. Let me go! Let me! Toby! Sorry, 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 Joe. Sorry, love. How can you forget that cue, Toby? You're supposed to be hanging onto my sleeve. Yeah, sorry, I know. Uh, can we try it again? If you'd be so kind, Toby, that would be very nice. Sorry, sorry, love. Let me go! Let me go! Oh, are you going to bite me? You're as fierce as a wolf. Let me go! No, I won't. Well, then I'm not going another step with you. Not another inch, do you understand? And how will you get away from me on this mountain? Uh, uh... I'll jump off that ledge if I have to. What, dash yourself into a thousand pieces? Well, go on if that's what you want. Well, you're a fine one to go hunting with. Indeed. And it's not only bears I hunt. So I see. Hunting bears is a fine sport, but this is the best sport of all, I think. Uh, Toby, could you make that a bit more suggestive? It's a little matter of fact at the moment. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll try. Can you cue me, love? Uh, where from? From So I See, you mean? Uh, yeah. No, no, you better go for the line of thought. Oh, oh, damn it. What, what was my line before that one? Uh, Toby, let's just go with Maya's line. Well, you're a fine one to go hunting with. All right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I remember. <clears throat> well, you're a fine one to go hunting with. Indeed. And it's not only bears I hunt. So I see. Hunting bears is a fine sport. But this is the best sport of all, I think. No, no, no! Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm just not feeling it. Let's take a break. Back in 15 minutes, all right? Okay. Sorry. Poor Toby. But we mustn't be too hard on him. He was a good soul. Impossible to work with, but... He was all right, right on, on the, the night. night. Strange looking back. There I was, acting Maya, fighting off the horny bear hunter. When at home, you couldn't wait to get away from me. Like Rubeck. At least he was mourning a lost love. Who is your secret woman? There wasn't one. Really? What about that poet you had the hots for? What was her name? <laughs> You mean Kara? Yes, that little floozy. Well, it wasn't her fault. I'd have screwed anything that moved just to... Screw us up. Yes, I told you. I know. I couldn't cope with it all. Pathetic. Go on. I deserve it. What's the point? It's done. It's finished with a lifetime ago, for God's sake. And yet... And yet what? I need to make sense of it. Forget it. We're old. Ten years to go if we're lucky. Or unlucky. There you go. You've been talking death since the day you were born. Jumping off bridges, hanging yourself. Always the drama queen. It felt real enough then. What did? The pain. What use for? Lights, camera, action. And now we reflect. You do. Some of us are too busy living. Rushing around, you mean? Listen to you. Get a life. Stop moping around all day writing those bloody poems. I'm a writer. It's what writers do, they write things. Like Ibsen? Not like Ibsen. But I like the idea of him sitting down in old age, writing about a lost love of his youth, making a play out of it. And a fat lot of use it did him, eh? Hello? Hello? Oh, there you are, Rubek. I've been looking for you everywhere. But I see you're not alone. Have you come from the hotel? Uh, no, no, not, not that mausoleum. We've been in the open air. We? Oui? I mean myself and that horrid bear hunter, of course. Ah, him. Yes. 
We've been high up in the mountains. So much excitement, <sighs> Maya. We mustn't overdo it. Oh, there's no chance of that. We have plenty of energy. But you're always so tired, Rubeck. One doesn't grow younger, Maya. One doesn't grow younger. Perhaps you're tired of me, Rubeck. Is that the reason for all this exhaustion? Perhaps you'd be happier with someone your own age. Someone like this lady you seem to have got talking to. Oh, this lady is someone I've known for a long, long time, Maya. I knew it. But there's no need to be anxious on my account. From now on, I'm going to live my own life. I've even written a little ditty about it. Have you now? Yes. And it goes like this. I am free, I am free, no more prison life for me. I'm free as a bird on the wing. Maya! Oh. Oh. Excuse me, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, you're not interrupting. We're finished, aren't we, Rubeck? Yes. So, if you'll excuse us, we're off on another adventure. Yes, we're going right up to the top of the mountain. I wish you luck. Oh, <laughs> there's no luck involved. I am a man of the mountain. All we need is my skill and experience and a sharp knife. Then I wish you all the ill luck in the world. <laughs> <laughs> now there is a wish worth having. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. <laughs> Isn't youth wonderful? I can't believe I ever had so much vim. Here I am, an old woman, old enough to play Irene to your Rubeck, the long-lost love who comes back to haunt him. And why not? She wanted to kill him with that sharp little knife she carried. They deserve it for having no balls? Yes, that's right. She couldn't forgive him for not screwing her when she modelled for him. And can you forgive me for screwing you up? Is that what you want? My forgiveness? It would help. Help what? Coming to terms with it all. You mean your life? Yes. Or is that so strange? Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing at our age? Making sense of it all before it's too late? Speak for yourself. I'm not ready to exit just yet. Besides, don't kid yourself. You didn't screw me up. I screwed around, perhaps. Painfully, I heard. Yeah, I took a few knocks. For real? Yes. If you want to know, that nice theatre director, Sam, the one you admired so much. Yes. He had balls. He kicked the shit out of me for two months. I'm sorry. Oh, what's to be sorry about? I was kicking myself. It could have been anybody. He just fitted the bill. Along with Simon and Chris, two good friends of mine. Okay. I was trying to pay you back. Yeah, I got the message. But I gave you another chance that day in Manitoba. We could have made up. I know. I remember it like it were yesterday. Like you say in your poem, I wore my favourite purple coat and scarf, and you were in that smelly raccoon coat of yours you picked up in some thrift store somewhere. You looked like an old trader from the Hudson Bay. At least it kept me warm. We started walking out across the lake. And then we came to that old car. Not far from shore, a stone's throw from the battered shacks, a rusting car squatted on the ice. And you explained that locals bet good dollars on the date the spring thawed melt would plunge this cargo through the fissured cracks, which even now let out a creaking, deep plumbed sound, which presages warmth and seismic shifts to come. And you started shitting yourself. <laughs> and I was scared. 
alarmed some sudden split would turn this safety net of frozen pelt into a bubbling splintered mass of shards while I would thrash and bobble out of view, submerged by molten flows. And we wound up in the empty lakeside diner. Retreating, running almost, to the lakeside diner, I breathed again and thawed cold fingers on hot chocolate cups and talked in general terms of this and that, wrapped up in fur, cocooned against your warmth. Yes, it was all too much for you, wasn't it? You couldn't do it to save your life, could you? And so the spring arrived, the wages won, the losing slips discarded in the slush. But I held out against the season's pull and clung to flows, defiant, unsubmerged, an ice man to the last, while you melted away down to the depths and lay with wreckage on that bed of tears. Yes. It's all there. And you were right about the beds and the tears. Oh. So, uh, where is this fine mountain lodge you were telling me about? Over there. That pigsty! Well, it's not quite a castle, I grant you, but it'll do for our purposes. And what purpose is that? For us to rest it. You may rest assured I shan't step foot in it. Oh, well that is a pity. For I have spent many a fine summer's night in there with my companions. You mean with your other goats? Oh, ho, ho. so I am no more than a mountain goat now, am I? Yes, with your horns. <laughs> and you can see them, can you? Yes, great big ugly horns you Oh, have. well then, beware my tongue! <laughs> oh, please, Mr. Alpine, try to behave yourself. I was just in sport. Well, I'm tired of your sport, and I'm tired of you. I'm going back down to the hotel. Uh, that is easier said than done, my fair companion. You'll need my help. I'm very sure I can manage on my own. The more fool you. You doubt my strength, Mr. Ulfheim. It's not a matter of strength. It is a matter of knowledge and experience. You see that mist? Yes. In no time at all, it'll close in. You won't be able to see a thing. You wouldn't last five minutes on the descent. Well, then, you must help me. What else are you good for? <laughs> you are as sharp as an adder. <laughs> Here, take my hand. Certainly not. I shall follow behind you. Very well, madam. As you wish. Let us hurry. The mist is closing in. We haven't got a moment to lose. I remember that scene. And Maya was right. So many horny men in the world. At least I could trust Toby. Yes. I seem to remember his inclinations lay in another direction. Yes, bless him. And he didn't find it easy playing the tough guy, poor thing. Went all around? Yes. Even Roland. What? Well, you never told me that. I thought the old devil was past all that sort of thing. Well, you were wrong. He still had a twinkle in his eye. <laughs> Randy Roly Rubick, eh? Yep. Everyone. Except you. The Iceman. Melting away. Back to Blighty. And silence. What can I say? Except words, words, words. Poems, yes, if that's what you mean. I mean you were writing obituaries. Obituaries? Yes. To us, to our life together, born London, died Manitoba. We've been dead for decades. Why the exhumation? Because, like Rubeck, I'm still haunted by it. So, you're trying to bring me back to life? Yes, in a way. I want to be left in peace. Rest in peace. Isn't that what the tombstones say? Just let me be. 
but I can't. So what do you want from me? To say I'm not mad as hell at you for mummy to kiss it better? Something like that. And will that make everything okay? It may do. I've no idea how you feel about me. Well, let me tell you. At first, I hated you. Every memory of you I wanted to exterminate. I wanted to cut it out of my brain. I tore up every letter you ever wrote to me. Every piece of clothing you'd seen me wear. I trashed everything you touched. I wiped you out. You'd never existed. You were dead, dead, dead. Now, after all these years, how do I feel about you? I wish you no ill, but apart from that, indifference, nothing. You don't exist for me. Not even in memory? Not if I can help it. Steady does it. Look, Arthur. Where? you see through the mist? It's them. Who? Rubeck and the old woman, his long lost love. So it is. Uh, what are they doing coming up the mountain in this weather? Certain death for them. Can't we avoid them? That's impossible. There's no other way up or down on this side of the mountain. Then we shall face them out here. So, once again our paths cross, Maya. Do you have any idea how much danger you're in? Did you see the mist closing in? We did. But we thought we'd start out anyway. It seemed easy enough on the lower slopes. Ha! It is easy enough down there. But now you're up here. You're stuck. You can't go up or down, and I can only take one of you down at a time. Of course. You must take my head with you first. And you must stay here. Don't take another step. I'll send some rescuers. We're in no need of rescuing. We're not going down. We're going to the very summit of the mountain. Are you mad? Didn't you hear the thunder? There is a big storm coming. There may be avalanches. It's, it's certain death up there. We're happy. Come what may. Well, on your head be it. Come, Maya. Let us hurry and don't be afraid to trust me completely. Oh, how I shall sing if I get out of this alive. So, are you ready? Oh no, my old friend. I'm with Maya. I'm opting for life. Then I shall have to go on alone. Didn't you always? True. He travels furthest who travels alone. Yes, but there's a cost. Ah, but did I have a choice? Big question. Little answer, perhaps. Too late for philosophy now. What's done is done. But like Rubeck, the Iceman could melt, or at least thaw a little. A nice thought. Perhaps if you warmed me a little. I tried that. It didn't work. Yes. I remember the warm times, the loving times. Yes. But you didn't love me, remember? I must make a start. There isn't much time now. So, you're determined to go on? Onwards and upwards, yes. Maya isn't the only one who can sing. <laughs> I am free, I am free. No more prison life for me. I'm as free as a bird on the wing. You're crazy. Who could be happy to die? Listen, I'm demob happy. I've had my three score years and ten. Isn't that enough for anyone? 
And you know what the old poet says after that? If you live to be four score, it's nothing but trouble and strife. And that's right. My body's crumbling, but my spirits are fine. In fact, to my great surprise, they've never been finer. I don't need all this anymore. The world of 10,000 things, as the Taoists call it. I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt, as we used to say. I've finished with rushing around. My life, it, it's all up here. My brain's full. My memory bank's full. I'm done and dusted. I've come full circle. I'm a big, fat, gurgling baby, smiling at everything. Smiling at everybody, going goo, goo, goo. Whatever comes next is fine with me. As the poet says, there's a hell of a good universe next door. Let's go. And why all this? I just wanted to see you. I just wanted to say goodbye. And you know what? It's better now. Even the pain feels good. It's a soothing, healing pain. So thank you, my old ghost. Thank you. Thank you. Striving, he is free. The world of ten thousand things seen from afar, no longer bound, he knows the joys of peace. I am free, I am free, no more prison life for me. I am free as a Thank you, thank you. Oh.